Okay, it is time to do the May wrap up. And as predicted, I did not read as much as I did in April, but I still read quite a bit. I read 13 things. I think it was over 4,000 some pages. I'm very content with it. Like, especially with how busy the month was. And I have a lot of books on here that are like all time new favorites. I also have a lot on here that are like completely forgettable and not for me or were like bad experiences. So it was definitely one of those months that was a mixed bag, but I tend to take away the positives. So that's really exciting to me. And if you're new to my wrap ups, I put things into categories. There will be timestamps down below. You can hop around. It just makes it more fun for me. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Each month I do something different. This month is a little bit based off more genre breakdowns than anything else. Sometimes I do things by theme, but this month I actually got back into reading more science fiction which was really exciting. Hopefully we'll continue that trend into June and we will get into it starting with actually I believe the science fiction then we'll have a lot of like fantasy split into categories and end with a miscellaneous section. We'll first talk about The Hidden Girl and Other Stories by Ken Lewis is the second short story collection I've read by him and I think the second one published by him the first one being The Paper Menagerie that I read earlier this year. The Paper Menagerie is almost universally loved and praised and then not everyone really loves The Hidden Girl. I really liked The Hidden Girl. I think it's a very different collection with a different focus. It's definitely heavier on the science fiction aspects and less about the human experience aspects that are stronger in The Paper Menagerie, which I think can lead to that dissonance. But I really enjoyed the interconnectivity of these short stories and the different angles and time points in which we are answering some of these sci-fi questions. It, it was a very solid collection for me. I think there were some that are more forgettable or difficult for me than others. Like I wouldn't say this is necessarily a five star collection for me, but it's like a four, four and a half star collection. I had a lot of fun reading some of these stories and it's one of the few science fiction collections that I kind of wanted to sit down and read story after story after story. Normally I can only read one or two short stories a day, if that, because short stories, it's just can be really abrupt going in and out of them. But the way he writes, it just works really well for me. And I really like the questions that he's asking and how he answers them. It was also really great to read this before getting into his epic high fantasy series. So I've now read all the short story collections, going to go into the novels and we'll see what happens. He's really impressed me as an author so far. The next one's Caressed by Ice. This is the third Sci Changeling book. And I put this in sci-fi because it's, it's a sci-fi futuristic world with the telekinesis and like telepathy and the shape changing is actually more science based than like paranormal based, I feel personally. It's a really fun time. I was doing a puzzle and I needed something to listen to and I devoured it in a day. Similarly, you know how I listened to the second book in a day. I've really enjoyed the narrator and it was just a really good time. It's, it's really interesting with this series because I'll start each of the books and I never find the first paragraph or the first chapter very gripping. I'm always just like, okay, I don't know why I care, but let's just go. And then somehow, insidiously, at some point, I'm just like, yeah, what's going to happen next? And I'm like really enthralled. I don't think I ever get as close to the characters as I want to get, but they're really fun. Like, I think they fill that like serialized fiction void that I've been like kind of searching for in my reading. I haven't found a series that's serialized like this that works for me in a really long time. So I'm, I'm going to continue on with it. It's been really fun. And I am like the meta plot as it's like developing, I am interested in like, what are we going to do here? And the next two sci-fi are actually both by the same author, but they're different series. These are two Octavia Butlers. Um, the first one I read this month was Dawn, the first book in the Xenogenesis or Little Brood trilogy. I don't know what its official name is, <laughs> but regardless, I read the first book. I did a spoiler vlog, which assuming I have my life together is a finally live on Patreon. Thank you everyone who's been really patient about that between graduation and vacation and then getting sick. Things, things have happened. But I, I enjoyed that one. And what I've noticed, especially between this and Parallel of the Sower, is that Octavia Butler really does like focusing on how does a, a community form, change, affected when X is the scenario. And in Dawn, we have humans coming together under um, very stressful scenario. I want to be vague because I do think part of what's fun about reading Dawn is like you wake up with the main character and you're like, what's happening? It's one of those type of intrigue plots where if I tell you what's happening, you'll probably still enjoy it. But for me, at least the first couple chapters, I was with Lilith. I'm like, what is happening? What is going on? So for that reason, it's hard for me to discuss it, but I do think it's a book that lends itself to discussion. Like a lot of Octavia Butler's, it's nothing flashy, but it's it's deep enough that it really lends itself to starting really compelling conversations with myself, with others. Like I just think about the decisions she's made to put certain antagonistic forces against our protagonist. And I'm like, that's a really interesting decision. 
And my only complaint about this one is that you can tell it was written in the 80s. Um, and what I mean by that is it has some very um, just heteronormative stuff in there that's like really blatant. And you can just, I don't know, I feel like every other Butler I've read has not aged itself. Um, a lot of times science fiction classic sci-fi ages itself, whether it's referencing the Cold War or nuclear power or something. Usually there is like, oh, this was written here because this wasn't a thing we were discussing. And here it was aged just based on how we've used sexuality and things like that. So that's like my, my, my one complaint, but I'm really interested to see where it goes, especially with where we left off. And then I did actually on the last day of May read Parable of the Sower, which is I think besides Kindred, the most well-known Octavia Butler. So I hadn't hadn't planned to read this until I'm going to be on this Saturday. So the day after this, we're on Aaron's channel to discuss this book. I'm really curious to hear what her and Tammy think of this one. And so this is a diary, essentially. I know people say it's like letters, but to me, it read like a diary of this woman. Um, she's a young woman, I think 15 when we meet her. And she is dealing with a lot of the turn of the century trouble. So it's like 2020s, climate change is happening, civilization is devolving. It's it, it's really rough. And she's with her community, her parents, and she is contemplating the universe and how to survive. And it's her musings on the day-to-day -day stuff that's happening. And it does pick up plot-wise, like things get stressful. But also it's her musings on religion and what she believes. Um, she's also a person who has hyper empathy, so she will feel the pain of other individuals around her. What I thought was the best part of this wasn't necessarily the musings of this woman. I mean, she definitely feels wise beyond her years. Like, there's definitely an argument to be made of how is this how a 15 year old thinks? Like, how is she this composed? That didn't really bother me. I just didn't find her that interesting. I was more, it felt very. Um, distant. And I think that was kind of the point because I think the author, you know, the, the woman writing this also was distancing herself from the trauma of her days. But there comes a point where we switch back into the Butler mindset of, ooh, what's happening to this community? And I really liked that and I actually could really see how um, bits of other sci-fi fantasy that I really loved came from community building like this. And I read the foreword by Jemison after I read this and it was really interesting because Jemison's read it three times she said in the foreword and didn't really like it till the third time and but every time took something different because she read it in like a different decade of her life and I think in the most recent time she kind of put the nail on the head of something that I really appreciated about it is that not only this is a sci-fi that is predicting what could happen in the future. Everyone talks about that. This is so on the nose. And like one of the reasons Jemison didn't like it as much in the 90s is that like when you read this when it came out in the 90s, it did not feel as possible. Um, but also, not only does it show you the problem and plays it out to a conclusion, it gives you like actionable steps. Like you see these people responding in ways that kind of make sense. It doesn't feel outlandish. And I've had this disconnect with resistance or rebellion, like fantasy and sci-fi lately, because all of it just feels so like, oh, that's, but we can't do that. That's not how we solve the problem. And the things that are done here are small, but feel attainable and like are kind of a blueprint. Maybe not for everyone, but I don't know. It's a work that I don't know if I necessarily enjoyed a lot while reading it. It was fine, it was consumable, but I never like had the, ooh, what's going to happen next sort of thing. But again, it had me thinking about stuff. I like thinking about it, I like reading articles about it. I'm excited for a book club on it. So Butler, I don't know, will ever be like a five star book author. But in terms of like the collective work, it's like five star thinking about sci fi author. I don't know. So those are all the sci fi that I read now into all of the fantasy. We're going to start with some novellas and prequels, get the little ones out of the way. I read I don't think it's a prequel, but it's the second novella in the Up and Under series, which is in the Alchemist Journals, Shauna McGuire situation. That's the Salt Lice Seas. I don't have much to say about it. It's the second book. Um, it's middle grade for adults, and it's fine. It's just not my favorite type of middle grade. Um, the first one was definitely more middle grade. That's like The Wizard of Oz or Narnia, like those vibes. And this one was more adventure. I don't know if that makes sense, but it wasn't my favorite tropes in that area and I didn't care as much about what our characters were going through, but I just wanted to read it because I knew it would probably be the excerpts that were used in Seasonal Fears, so I just wanted to have it. It's interesting seeing what parts of it are going to be important in the main novel plot, so I like it as a companion. But if I wasn't reading Middle Game and Seasonal Fears and the other books that'll be in that series, I probably would DNF these because they're just not for me. But I do 
like them as a companion to the whole. And then the first prequel that I read was New Spring by Robert Jordan. This is my favorite Wheel of Time book. Why, why couldn't they all be like this? Why? <laughs> I really like this one. Um, it's about Moraine. It's about how Moraine starts her quest that you meet her with in the eye of the world. Um, it's about how she meets Lan. My favorite part of this book is that Moraine gets to be friends with Swan and we get to watch an actual friendship happen on page, which literally does not happen very often. It happens for fleeting moments in the nine books that I've read in Wheel of Time. Here, I had at least half a book of these two women, powerful, strong-willed women, being allies and friends with each other. And I loved it. And all it does is prove to me that he could do it all along and just didn't. <laughs> which is a choice. So I really liked it. I really liked how because it was forced to be more focused, it actually had a beginning, middle and end. I know some people I think when they pick it up, they expect the emphasis to be more on Moraine and Lan. And that's really not the emphasis of the story. It actually is more about Moraine and Swan. So I think if you just know that going in, I mean, I didn't know what it was going to cover. And I was actually quite happy that it focused on that interpersonal relationship. Like, I mean, I guess I would have been okay seeing more of Moraine and Land, but I also thought this was the appropriately length book. If it was any longer than this, I probably wouldn't have liked it as much. Like it being like a 400 page book was was great. And then the other one I read because I'm getting into Robin Hobb again was The Willful Princess and the Piebald Prince and it was glorious. This is one of my favorites of the month. It was so good. Just the writing style. It just it felt like a cozy dark fantasy, which is just like one of those things I always love. It was great being back at Buckkeep, getting to know the six duchies again, getting more insight into the magic system of this world and why it has certain connotations and society. It's really good. And I've already started Fool's Errand. If you've seen my TBR, you know, and I can definitely see why people are like, you probably should read this before this. Like, I know that's not publication order, but like it wouldn't hurt. And it's true because a lot of the political tensions in Tawny Man have to do with the magic system and like what happened in the past with this piebald prince. And you get glimpses of it in Fool's Errand. But having the entire context of this story has actually been, I think, really interesting to fit in. So I'm really happy about that. Briefly, my next one is just New Orleans fantasy because I did a whole vlog where I read New Orleans fantasy while I was in New Orleans. I really liked doing that. It's not that any of these were like my favorite stories, but I thought it was so awesome to read works in a city that I was visiting for a first time. And like, I don't know, I'm not a visual reader, but being able to like read in a book this place and then see that place in real life it just really connects some dots or like you know walking the streets you can get a better sense of what is the architecture like what is the author describing especially since like for me if someone just says words i don't always see it so it was so fun to do that the first one i read was the black god's drums by p jelly clark and i just think that he is going to be such a fun author for me when i'm not reading his detective based stories I really enjoyed this. I thought for how short it was, how it accomplished world building, character connection. I, I enjoyed the mentor-mentee relationship, the incorporation of the gods among men trope, the alternative steampunk vibes. Like I, I really liked the entire package of this story. Um, honestly, I probably would love it more and it would last longer with me if it was an entire novel, but it was perfect for just consuming on a plane ride, which is when I was consuming it. And I really liked the audiobook because this was one that I immersion read. And then I read The Ballad of Perilous Graves, which I really appreciate. This is definitely a book that I appreciate more than I liked reading. And honestly, if I hadn't read it the week I had, I probably would have struggled with it more just because it is a love letter to New Orleans period, end of story, and I'm really glad it exists. <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, pacing, connecting to characters, caring about the plot, I struggled a little bit there. Um, and maybe part of that is the emphasis on a lot of stuff and references that I might not have picked up on. Like there were literally moments when I was reading the book, I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I went to this park yesterday because it's only because I read that statue sign that I know what we're talking about in this scene right here. Like it truly is not a let's teach you about New Orleans. No, it's about the soul of New Orleans and fighting for the soul of New Orleans. And it is, it's not a, you know, it, it's not a tourist's guide. It, it's, it's a person who lives their guide. If you're a local, if you love the city, I think you're going to get so much of it. I think it's got the vibes of that so good. The incorporation of music into the soul, into the magic, the different POVs we have and different points of life that they are at and it is confusing. If one of your turnoffs is when things are non-linear or not straightforward and they're world building or execution, I might steer you away from this a little bit. 
Um, that was part of the fun for me is I was like, wait, what is happening? Wait, what, how do these connect? And it does kind of tell you, but it's, it's interesting. You're kind of in two timelines and it's really weird. I'm being vague because I think that's kind of the twisty discovery of this story, but it does make it a little confusing, especially when some of the plots start to come together. I, that was a struggle for a minute. I think it's just a little on the long end for me for how much work it was, but that said, I'm just really glad that I read it, even if it won't be a favorite of all time. I just, I don't know, man. I just think it accomplished its goal, even if, like, I was not the audience for that goal, if that makes sense. And then my last fantasy category will be fantasy faves, because I just want to, you know, end on, well, end in the fantasy section on my super positive notes. This is not going to be a surprise to anyone who's been watching my videos this month, but first we'll talk about The Discord of Gods. The last book, Course of Dragons, I have a should you read for that series, which everyone's always like, well, you're, you're, the answer is yes, right? I'm like, well, yes, if. It's always caveats for everything, right? The no one book is for everyone or else the world would be a very boring place, but I loved it. Um, specifically, the latter half of it was unputdownable for me. I read the last 250 pages in 24 hours. I was pretty slumpy before that. I don't know if it was the book's fault or life's fault. It was definitely one of those, we need to set up everything and then let's let the dominoes fall sort of scenarios. Uh, but all the characters and how they came together and the footnotes and... Uh, it's just so great because every time someone else starts reading any of the books in the series, I just get to relive some of my favorite moments as people comment like, oh my god, I just got to this scene, or that footnote also got me. Like, it's been so fun in the Discord seeing that. So this book was great. Stuck the landing. I'm so glad I own all of these, and I cannot wait to reread them one day. They just bring me so much joy. I love these characters, and like, it's for sure a series that will be enhanced on reread because you, you can't get everything on a first read. You don't even know where you're going for the first three books. Like, this book series is so good, and it's I think, a really good medium-large fantasy series. You know, it's not as epic and huge as Stormlight Archive. It's not just your standard trilogy. I just think it's a really good meaty fantasy series. And then the biggest surprise hit of the month, because I knew I was going to love Discord of Gods. Who are we kidding? But that was Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher. And this, like, hit me in my moment. And it's, like, dark fairy tale, which is, like, my buzzwords all day, every day. And somehow... And please do not take this of an, if you like this, you might like that, like to its core. This is me just literally telling you how I felt when I read it. You might not feel the same way, but I felt while reading this how I felt while watching the movie Stardust. And the movie Stardust is one of my favorite pieces of media of all time. And it's really hard to find that type of thing. Even the book Stardust does not accomplish it. And this is not the same type of fantasy. I think the movie Stardust is a much lighter fantasy. It's a lighter fairy tale. Nettle and Bone is dark fairy tale, but the character banter, once we get your team of people together in this book, you are going to be rooting for a chicken. There is a bone dog. There are, it's just such a good team of people and it's amazing. I got to buddy read this with my friend Jocelyn and we both were just like, oh, this is so great. And I just, I couldn't not buy myself a copy. And so I did. It's just, it was cozy for me. And Mara's a 30-year-old woman who doesn't really know what she's doing with her life. And that's really relatable at this moment in my life. And I think it met me in my moment in addition to having so many tropes I like. And I was hoping T. Kingfisher might become a favorite author of mine. I'm not sure yet, but I read two of their works. And both times, the thing that I loved the most was character dialogue and interaction, which is kind of one of the most important qualities for me in consuming any media. So it's very promising. And I just... It was such a great time. I loved it. Um, I might still try and do a review for it. I just don't know how to coherently talk about my favorite things. It's a struggle. And now we'll just do the last section real quick. It's just miscellaneous stuff. One I don't have much to say about, and that's Burnt Sugar. Easily my least favorite of the month. Would have DNF'd it if it was not for book club. And my local book club, no, none of us liked it. None of us had a good time. I don't know. We just, we didn't connect. We didn't like anybody. <laughs> And then, like, I think there were moments where I understood what the author was doing, but I just didn't care for that style of execution. It's like, I see why you did that, but I still don't like that you did that. Like, I don't, I don't have that many more thoughts. I basically consumed it, made thoughts to go to book club, and then once book club was done, just let it leave my brain because I don't have space for it. <laughs> and I do think there's just, um, in literary fiction, there's just this focus on parent-child relationships that when they are toxic, 
I have very little patience sometimes for certain portrayals of it. Like, I don't think it was a negative portrayal or like an inaccurate one. It's just that like, I don't always need to consume it for entertainment or for catharsis. Like it's not, it's not doing it for me. And that just happened. This one's about a daughter and her mother and it was a lot. Um, so I don't know. I really struggled to read this one. Didn't really like it. And then one that I really did like, and we'll, we'll discuss more with Jess when we get it together. And that's Red Famine. This was a very good nonfiction. I consume this primarily with audio and it's definitely the type that makes you angry. I read it after reading parts of The Gates of Europe, which is our other book for that nonfiction book club. So I had a little more context for some of the players that were mentioned because in the intro of this book, it gives you a brief catch up till the early 20th century. And then you go basically most of the 20th century with a focus on the 20s and 30s in Ukraine. And I really liked how the information was parsed into their chapters and how it was given to me. I really, I really think it balanced the human storytelling aspect with the factual aspects really well and gave me a good picture of what was going on. I was just really engaged and I learned a lot about a piece of history that we don't talk about a bunch. So I think it accomplished a lot of its goals. And that's usually my main metric for rating nonfiction is like, what was your goal? Did you accomplish your goal? You know, that, that sort of thing. I'm not as harsh on rating nonfiction as I am fiction. So that because I, I guess I don't plan to be as entertained <laughs> most of the time. But that's it for this video. That's the whole wrap up. Let's see what emoji should we do? Oh, I don't know. Is there like, let's do a sun for dawn, like a sunrise or sunset. I don't really care. We're just going to do a sun because that seems fun because I just looked down at my sheet and that was the first thing that caught my eye. Let me know what were the highlights, the lowlights, you know, any of that stuff from your month. Um, and like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.